This is the Active Commercial Real Estate Investing Show, a podcast designed explicitly for the ambitious commercial real estate investor who wants to generate outsized returns. Hello and welcome to the Active Commercial Real Estate Investing Show brought to you by the one and only School of Commercial Real Estate Investing. I'm Patrick. And I'm Noelle. And today we're joined with Monique Hom. Monique is the founder of Real Estate Investor Goddess. She is an educator and advocate for female real estate investors and has a mission to help 1 million women achieve financial freedom through real estate. Monique is a real estate investor and syndicator and owns, together with her investors, over 1,000 residential doors and industrial assets across 15 states. She's a graduate of McGill University and Columbia Law School. She is the number one best-selling author of the Real Estate Investor Goddess Handbook and Invest Like a Goddess, Advice from the Most Successful Women in Real Estate. Monique is also a TEDx speaker, podcast host, real estate strategy mentor, yogi, world traveler, recovered attorney, wife, and mother of three amazing kids. Monique, you seem to do it all. We're excited to learn how you do it. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. As I was telling you before, we were listening to a lot of podcasts that you were interviewed on while we were driving up to the mountains the other weekend. So definitely fangirl moment for me. Um, I'm super excited, especially being another woman that is getting into commercial real estate. It's really awesome to have the diversity in the space and coming from, um, I know you had said in a previous podcast as well, you kind of came from not really knowing real estate. And I feel like so many people come from having a connection you know, prior or having someone who knows about it. So excited to dive in. Would love to hear from you about how you got started in real estate and the why you got started in commercial real estate. Sure. So I got started really by accident. Live in Los Angeles, which is a super expensive market. And um, back in 2005, I was working as a lawyer and I had always been taught, the only thing I'd been taught about real estate is that at some point you should buy a house to live in, right? It was never something you invest in, you just buy the house. So I'd been working for a couple of years. I was like, okay, I guess it's time to buy that house. But LA was such an, is such an expensive market. Even back in 2005, a starter home was upwards of $500,000, dollars And I, I couldn't afford that by myself. So I ended up um, house hacking. You know, that's how you guys started. But I, I, I got uh, with a friend. We bought a, um, a multi-unit. We each took a room in a larger unit. We rented out. There was an upstairs two-bedroom that we rented out. And then there was a little back house. Uh, it was a garage had been converted. We rented that out too. We rented out our basement. And then I was like a landlord. And these people were paying my mortgage. So it was awesome. <laughs> that's how I got <laughs> into the game. Yeah, still didn't really think of it as a you know a way to you know leave my job, which I really really hated. It was it was still just oh that's how I managed to buy that house I'm supposed to buy. But when I met my husband, he had a he had a duplex, and um, you know after the crash in 2008, we ended up selling one of the duplexes, and we ended up uh, flipping. So we started to flip, which was what I, the only thing I thought real estate investing was, because that's what I'd seen on TV. <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, we're going to invest in real estate, so we'll, we'll flip, because like that <laughs> shows. Uh, and we'd, like, we've done rehab in our house, we can flip. And it was a really good time to be flipping, because you could, houses were super on sale. You could buy a house and fix it, and just, you could make tons of mistakes, which, you know, with hindsight being 2020, I realized so many mistakes we made, but we could still make money. Um, so we were doing that until about 2015 when houses weren't so on sale. Looking back there, there, I wish I, <laughs> I wish I'd bought more then too, but they were definitely not as on sale. Um, and it's a lot more competitive and it was, and it was also not passive, right? Um, you, when you're flipping, you buy a property, fix it up, it's, you're working and then you sell it hopefully at a profit, but then you have to start over again to continue to, to make money. And I wanted something more passive. I wanted to 
the buy a property, put in tenants, you know, just get that mailbox money, just like not have to keep working so hard. Um, but in LA, it was like virtually impossible to find something that would cash flow. I, I for a I was looking for a fourplex, everything was at least two million dollars, and you know, I was lucky if it broke even. Um, and at that time, I ended up meeting a man who had become my mentor. So I was in a I was in a mastermind at the time, and I was talking to this other guy who was in my mastermind saying, yeah, it's really tough. I was like trying to find a, the right properties to flip and then looking for this fourplex and nothing cash flows. He said, you know, uh, my friend Robert Helms is the host of the Real Estate Guys radio show. He's coming to LA tomorrow night. Do you want to have dinner uh, with us? I was like, sure. Um, so we go and Robert was asking me about what I'm doing. And I was telling him that. And he said, you know, LA is a really tough market. I always say live where you want to live, invest where the numbers make sense. And I went, oh, <laughs> because until he said that, I just sort of assumed that you had to invest where you lived, where you could drive to your property, touch it, self-manage it. Like it didn't cross my mind that I could invest outside of my market. And LA is not the best market <laughs> for investing. It's super, super tenant friendly. Great if you're a tenant, sucky if you're a landlord. Um, also really hella expensive. And uh, it's just, you know, I'm like, oh, not to invest in LA. So literally that opened up the world. And then he said something, which is, you know, to answer your question, how it got into commercial. He said, and you can buy that fourplex, but you're limited to your own, you know, your own capital and credit. So alternatively, you could bring a group of investors together and you could buy a 100 or 200 unit apartment building. And he started telling me about the benefits of that. My brain was like, <laughs> exploded. I was like, what? Like, that's a thing? I literally thought you had to be a billionaire to do that kind of stuff. I had no idea that regular people could buy a, properties like that. But I had this full body, yes, like, yes, that's what I want to do. Like, it, just, it was so exciting. I loved like, everything about that idea. And so I went home that night, told my husband, there's this thing, it's called syndication. You bring investors to the you can buy, you know. Um, and so that was October of 2015. In January of 2016, we were at a syndication seminar in Phoenix learning how to do this. And we just went all in. We joined this, this high-end mastermind, there were a couple of them. And by that end of that year, uh, for less outlay of capital than we probably would have paid to buy that one fourplex by ourselves in LA, we were able to, with by partnering with others, acquire over a thousand doors. We've got a thousand and twelve doors in that one year. Um, through go through big this. or go home. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. So, like, so we did uh, we got five deals that year, two of which were passive, three were active, and uh, it was pretty incredible. That is amazing. I mean, that is a huge accomplishment in a very short amount of time going from a quad in mind to <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of <Yeah>. doors. <laughs> it was mind blowing. I couldn't, yeah, at the end of the year, I was like, wait, what did we just do? <laughs> that happened. It was, it was very cool. And I love and how one idea too, and, and one person being able to say something to spark the idea to be like, oh, Oh, wait, I, A, I don't have to buy in this crazy expensive market. That's no good for landlords anyway. And yeah. B, I don't have to use my own money. How great would that be? <laughs> I know, right? It was awesome. So yeah, it's just, it's been, it's like being able to go into the commercial space is really, it's been such a game changer because you can just, it's, it's scale, right? It's not, it's not much more work to buy um an apartment building or do a lot of industrial now like a factory or um you know a mobile home park it's not that much more work than buying one house and but the the impact is so much greater yeah and that's incredible that you did five deals in your first year of syndicating can you walk through that kind of emotional and mindset experience because i imagine that as you're doing your first one it feels like this big 
whale of a deal. You know, it's the biggest deal that you've done to date. Um, yeah. You know, you don't have necessarily that time horizon to really evaluate like how it's all going to pan out yet. Um, but instead of just waiting and seeing, you seemingly just went for it and <laughs> did four more right after that. Um, what was that like? You know, well, first I didn't do it alone. So I definitely made sure that I, I had mentorship. I was, you know, being advised by people that were wiser and had the experience. Um, I think the, what I've really learned with all of this is that you don't need to have any of any of the individual things yourselves, right? There are five main resources you need for real estate. You need to have uh, money, you need time, you need uh, relationships, experience, and the education, right? Knowing what to do. But if you're missing any of those, you can partner with other people that have that. You don't have to do it by yourself. In fact, you can't really do it by yourself. Well, maybe you can if you just or a trust fund maybe. <laughs> but even then, I wouldn't recommend that you do any of this by yourself because um, that's how you, you make mistakes. So I we never we never tried to do it alone. But our first the first thing we went for was it was kind of crazy having our my next door neighbor was a um, vi vice president of a real estate investment trust. At the time, she had done like three quarters of a billion dollars in um, in different real estate transactions. Huge experience, but all of that was at, under her work. So she she was they were working her like a manimal. She didn't really have time to. Um, to do this by herself, but she wanted to, to do some of her own deals. So what we did was we partnered with her um, and we said, well, we have the time to look for things. So we'll, we'll, we'll find the opportunities and she could underwrite in her sleep. So she, you know, she was going to do certain things. And our first deal that we went for um, was actually a $40 million um, <laughs> portfolio. <laughs> Here in Englewood, California, here, and uh, we ended up like getting to the best and final round. We did, we lost it in the end, which was a little crazy because then I was like, "Wait, what would I have done then? We had to raise all this money. It's never raised a penny." Uh, but it was like, "Let's let's do, let's go for it." I almost didn't know what I didn't know, you know. So um, just we just went, we went for it, and it was through relationships and different opportunities people you know the first deal we did was a mobile home park um a, a friend we'd had was doing a bunch he said i know you're trying to syndicate we have a an investor that was going to bring in money from korea he he's not able to bring in that money do you want to raise the amount do you want to raise this money we're like sure so um yeah let's do it so that was kind of how we started we just started and we just we just went for it it was ready fire aim um, more than, you know, it's like ready, aim, 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 aim. Yeah, we just <laughs> went. Some things worked out and some things didn't. Uh, it was that, uh, just go, we just, we just went for it with support. Yeah. And you've talked about relationships and partnerships and agree. Those are critical and so crucial to be able to have the mindset of like, okay, I can go in and it's not all on me. Like I have other people who have some of those other experiences that maybe I'm lacking or that we as a group need. What is your criteria for finding those partners that you work with? That's a great question. So one thing I learned from the brilliant Beth Clifford is that to look for the three C's and the, so the first, and these are in order of importance. So the first C is character. So, you know, what is the character of the person that you're going to be partnering with, um, teaming up with? So it's not something that you can be taught. And when somebody shows you who they are at first, believe them. So, you know, looking for, how, you know, how, how honest are they? How are they of integrity? How do they treat people? How do, you know, it's like, how are they treating the, maybe they're super nice to you, but they're terrible to the wait staff or something like that, right? Um, one of the, the worst partnerships that I've had ended up really, really biting me in the butt. I mean, this person, I, I was visiting the, the market and we went out, we stopped and she was saying, okay, um, you know, this is my employee. She just thinks I'm the property manager. Doesn't know I'm the owner. I'm going to like point to you and you're going to be the, you're going to like, you're the owner. 
Um, and I was like, okay, that's weird. But I should have been like, wait, <laughs> you're lying to your employee. You're like, like, wait, this is, there, there were red flags, right? I should have you know, seen that. Something's wrong with this picture. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, it's like, that is not, wait, what? In other words, don't, don't partner with people that are dishonest, but also, you know, that just, they have a character that um, are a good match for you and what you value and think is important. So character is the first, is the first thing. Um, and then after that is commitment. So commitment is in a couple of ways. And the, and this is for everybody that you work with. It can be team members, but so one is a commitment to this particular project, right? You don't want to have, um, somebody that you're, that you're going to partner with. They don't have the time and not showing up. They don't do what they say they're going to do when they, when they say they're going to do it. Um, so having that commitment and then also commitment to your shared mission, vision, and values. So one of my, one of, one of my values is I want to leave a property and a community better than I found it. So if we're working with somebody who's there just about getting every dollar out of a deal, I'm willing to be a slumlord or whatever. Like that is not going to be a match for me. Um, that's going to be like a, it's not, they're not going to share that commitment to that value. It's not going to work. Um, I also have a relationship for life philosophy. I want us, I, you know, when I'm thinking about how we're going to work together, it's not, like, let me get the most I can right now. Like, screw you. It's like, I want us to both, I want everybody to be happy. So we keep working together again and again and again and again forever. Right. Um, so that, that long-term orientation is something we both have to share. Cause if one of us has that orientation, the other one is like very, um, you know, sort of mercenary about their relationships. And that's not going to, that's going to be a mismatch. Not going to work either. So that that's the commitment piece. And then the last is the capacity. So do they have the capacity to do what you need them to do? Um, now, to a certain extent, some, some skills can be taught, um, but I find this is another thing I've learned, work with the best. They won't cost you money, they'll make you money. So I, I prefer whenever possible to you know, partner with people that are like at the top of their game and that's their capacity and that will always work out well. So that's what I look for, the character, the commitment and the capacity. Um, and when those are all there, always works out. I love that. And I feel like you brought up some good examples of how you can be looking for those things. And it's not something that's going to take years to figure out if they're the right partner, right? It could be over the course of a dinner. It could be over the course of a single interaction. So yeah, that's absolutely. great. And, you know, I like that you're like, listen to your gut as well. You know, if something seems like it's off, listen to the spidey sense, it's probably <laughs> off and you should really evaluate that. <laughs> For sure. Yes. See it, see it quickly and just go, you know what, maybe this is not the right fit. Yeah. Well, so building off of then your first year, you did the five deals you had some success. You said some, some things didn't work out, but overall things worked out well enough that uh, you decided to continue moving forward. What was next in the journey? Now that's all starting to blur together. Two or three more deals, um, but also where then we were run, you know, managing them, right? So when you're doing all of the real estate, it's a little bit like when you, I know you guys have a 10 month old, you have a new new baby. So when you're, when you're pregnant, right? Um, and you're starting your family, there's so much focus on the labor. <laughs> so much focus. I like all the books and like, you know, the labor or the pregnancy, what to expect when you're expecting. Um, and then it's like, and so much focus on the labor, which even if it's a super duper long labor, it's not going to take much more than a day or two. Right? Like, upset. <laughs> um, and then you have a whole lifetime where you have a child that you have to raise and, you know, hopefully make them good, good humans. Um, so after you, you buy a property, then you have to, to run it. So that's, <laughs> that was what we were spent a lot of 2017 doing more, you know, running the deals and figuring out what we, what we like, what we don't like as much. And so that, you know, that's kind of been the, the journey. And then we, we've just, we've explored different, um, asset classes throughout the years too. 
Yeah, I would definitely love to hear more about the asset classes and what led you from one to the another um, and talking about some of the benefits within those asset classes as as you moved from, you know, multi to mobile to RV, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've mostly been in the multifamily space and more in the probably since 2019, more okay. industrial. We did one mobile home park, one RV park, not as much our, you know, our, their thing. Um, but with the industrial, how that, how that happened and, and all of these different things they've come up because it's just through relationships. Uh, people have approached us around different things. We've looked into different asset classes and different markets and said, okay, yeah, we're, we're interested. Let, let's, let's go there. Um, and by partnering with people who had that experience, you know, we could piggyback off of their experience, their knowledge, and we didn't have to do it alone and start from scratch. So that's how we got into different things. And with the um, industrial, in so some two of the apartments that we bought in 2016, which were in Albuquerque, New Mexico, one was, let's just, I'll say C. <laughs> I'm generous with this. It could have been a D. It could have been a D. I won't lie. It was like, it was a real, you know, one particular was a super rough, rough property. It was like the day before we bought it, it was like a drive by shooting. And then there was, yeah, there was like, there were, oh, no. yeah, all bullets. It was every, every week we'd call our property manager kind of like cringing. Um, like, oh my God, what is, what is going to happen? There was, always something it was like the day after valentine's a property manager went and saw that one of the vacant units had been open and they found rose petals and hypodermic needles that was like nice so it was it was just yeah it was not it was not a fun not a fun place to, to not, a, not a great place to own um or it looked like it was up and coming not quite so we were pretty to, desperate to get rid of it because uh, it was just such a pain in our butt. Uh, and there was another one too that was not quite so bad, but neither of which were, were great. And this was definitely divine intervention, but I was praying like, I could use a miracle. <laughs> our, <laughs> our property manager said, uh, hey, would you consider selling these? I was like, um, I'd consider it for the right price. You know, we have investors. And and so we, we sort of went and figured out a price that was kind of crazy, but it was like, that's kind of the price we need, but we're going to go high and then they'll, you know, they'll negotiate down. But it was this like 1031 investor from California. And we gave this crazy price that was basically, it was essentially this, it was a four cap. It was our, you know, an Albuquerque, like a really like a D class in Albuquerque, New Mexico at a four cap. And they took the price. We, we sold it. We sold it. <laughs> so, which was awesome as a seller, but it was very, very scary for me as a buyer of multifamily. I was like, wow, I do not want to compete against people that will pay that price for those types of assets. Like, what else is out there? And uh, we're approached um, by a, a partner we'd done some deals with before who was saying, yeah, I'm buying this industrial property. It's like, really? Industrial? Tell me about industrial. And so we started looking into it, but industrial what didn't have the feeding frenzy uh, at the time the other commercial did, but there was an increasing demand for industrial as things were going online and online retailers need industrial space. They need warehouses. They need, you know, they need distribution centers. They need, <laughs> it was like, there was this, incre this increasing demand for industrial. And so at the beginning of 2019, we started getting into that. Um, we did very well during the pandemic. It was the best performing asset class, it's still um, doing well. And I love it because it's triple net too. So triple net is we buy it and the tenant pays rent. They also pay all the property taxes, pay all the insurance, and they pay all the maintenance. So there's a problem with the toilets, they fix the toilets. <laughs> the problem with the roof, they fix the roof. It's like all of the, you know, all of the, the inflationary pressures that have had that like all of that is on the tenant. None of that is us. We we pay our debt service 
And then we have long term, like 20 year leases with built in rent increases. We know exactly what the rent's going to be, exactly what our expenses are going to be. There are no surprises. So it's wonderful. Love it. It feels like so. passive without actually being passive. <laughs> it is super passive. It's amazing. <laughs> like, it's like passive to the 10th degree. Yeah, it's great. So with, um, you know, super, and, and our, the tenants are like eight, nine figure businesses that have been around for decades. And um, yeah, it's great. So that's what we really like. And, and then we're, we're always exploring different things. Yeah. It sounds like once you got into the industrial though, that was kind of a moment of, oh, wait a second. I can probably scale this using great relationships and, you know, being able to raise money to make this happen further so that it's less work for me and having to worry about what's going to happen on Valentine's day, um, <laughs> and property and who knows what neighborhood, um, you know, and be able to take an approach. Is that something that you are continuing to explore in terms of, you know, if you're looking at the percentage of your portfolio is industrial, the one thing that you're kind of like, this is the thing I know I can do and I'm going to do most of. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of industrial. So for the most part right now, our focus is more on the fundraising space as opposed to the operations. We have partners that are doing, that are dealing with more of the property management and, and that kind of thing. So we, as we went on, we realized we don't like that as much, right? So I love, um, I love acquiring the properties. I love being involved in design and, um, and shifting things. Although a lot of, most of our industrial, we do sale lease back. So we're actually buying, we buy it from a company that is using the property. They want to sell it, but then lease it back. Um, we do sale lease backs mostly. So we don't even have to touch those properties. <laughs> it's really very, it's quite easy. Um, so those, um, yeah, we, we love them and we, we have them and we'll continue to put those in our, our portfolio. Um, and then just as different, you know, when the right opportunities come up, I think commercial right now, there's a lot of distress in commercial and, um, which means there's a lot of opportunity to help people that are in distress and get those assets off their books at a, at a nice discount. So, um, we are, we're, we're open to different operators that are going to show up, um, where we can solve problems and, and get things at a really well, really well priced. Yeah. Can you quickly touch on the sale leaseback concept and mm -hmm. in particular, what is the benefit to the business that is selling to you and then leasing it back? Yeah. Why like would why, they do that? Why do companies do that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. That's what I, when I first I was like, wait, why would they do that? <laughs> they want the <laughs> property. So usually they'll do it. There are a couple of reasons, but mostly it's because they want to get the equity out of the property to put it back into their business. Um, so they could do a cash out refinance, but normally they're not going to get much more than 40% of the equity out. But if they want to get all of the equity out, they sell it. There are also benefits to them, um, there are tax benefits to them. So you, if you own a property outright, you're not spending anything on it, you're actually not getting any tax benefit. But if you're renting, you you can deduct the cost of your lease, right? So, um, and, all, and a bunch of other things that, that are uh, deductible. So it can be more tax beneficial um, and then often to get the equity. And sometimes we'll buy, we'll get these properties because um, the business is being sold to another um, entity and the entity will want the business of the business, but they don't want the real estate of the business. So we might buy the real estate and, and they'll, they'll keep the business. So there, that's, that's mostly why. Yeah. I, I find all of this about commercial absolutely fascinating because the business component or the fact that your tenants are businesses means that their motives for doing things are entirely different than in residential, right? Yeah. So what you mentioned with the sale leaseback is also similar to uh, what I've heard is commonly done with things like ground leases, where um, there are lots of companies out there who don't want to purchase a piece of land and then go through, you know, the years of rezoning it to what they need and then build, which is another, you know, 12, 24, 36 months. Um, 
you know, it, it, because that ties up their capital for way too long and they're not receiving tax benefits. So instead, you know, especially for some of these like smaller chain coffee shops, um, they'll just go in. They want a ground lease that is already ready for them to build. They pop up a super modular building that they can construct in a matter of months rather than years. And then they're off to the races and the investor just owns their land and the, the ground. Um, but the company is willing to go ahead and front the cost for the construction and do the land development simply because they don't want to tie their capital up for longer than they need to, which I think is absolutely incredible uh, and makes yeah. total business sense, but is not something that you necessarily think about when you're first getting into commercial. There's so many different ways. I, I, I know somebody who essentially flips land. So he'll buy the land and title it, do all that thing, so, but then sell it yeah. ready and titled, ready to go with often with the architecture, architectural designs, you know, just so somebody just buys it and runs with it. So there are a lot of different things that people can do. And I think when people have been in the residential space or they think about rent, you know, most people think about investing in real estate as buying a house, a single family house or, you know, apartments. Um, they don't think about, it's like every piece of property, every time you're standing on land or there's a roof over your head, like somebody owns that and that somebody could be you. Okay? There's like this pretty much any type of business building, you know, or even just land could be in his own by somebody. So I am waiting now for the HGTV land flipping show uh, to come <laughs> out to not to inspire people. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing visual about that, that show. <laughs> it's very boring. They're like, you're the man. It's yeah. the man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the, the side by side before and after is the exact same. <laughs> yeah. Like, here it is before, and now here it is with. The document. <laughs> you just put the profit super over the top of that, and that's all anyone yeah. will pay attention to. <laughs> yeah, the before and afters will not be super exciting. I don't know. I don't think that show would do very well, but <laughs> but the investors can do very well. That was important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that I'm I'm picking up on that I really appreciate about you is that um, you're not very eager to categorize yourself as a specific type of investor. You know, you're not like, I'm a multifamily investor through and through, and that's all I do. And I'm not an industrial, you know, investor, and that's all I do through and through. You're very much open to opportunity and finding what makes sense for you, given the particular market that you're in. Uh, and that seems like a, a dominant characteristic of your investing from when you first began. So um, I think that's something important to call out and probably something that has contributed to your success. Just this notion that, yes, you can specialize in something, but you don't necessarily have to, to be successful if you are looking at the bigger picture of what's going on and being opportunistic and open-minded about what's in front of you. Yeah, that's so true. I think to the extent that I've focused, right, my focus has been on relationship building and working with other investors and helping those investors, right? So, um, and then be, I think it's a value to our investors that we offer diversified opportunities. Right? I don't... I personally don't like having all of my eggs in one investment basket, like different markets, like different asset types. Um, and now we're looking at some international stuff. I like even having different currencies that I'm investing in. So the, all of that, I think, um, is a value that I can, you know, offer to my investors. Say, look, this is, you know, we just we bring opportunities that that we we like and that we've vetted but that are you know they're not all the same it's not all a cookie cutter yeah. yeah and when you talk about providing value to investors you've done very well with fundraising and raising capital can you provide like the 101 overview of fundraising for commercial and maybe a few key things that you learned along the way hmm that's a that could be a very long answer, but let me see if I can <laughs> distill down to the, the main nuggets. Um, I think one of the main things that's helped me is to focus on 
that it's not about me, <laughs> that it's actually about the other person. And what do what do they need? What's a match? What's so really learning about other other people and their what they're they're needing. Um, what problems do they have? How do we how do we help them solve their problems or or meet their desires? And when I shift because when I first started. I remember thinking, who is going to give me money? Like, why would they give me money? And of course, like, they don't want to give me money. (laughs) They want their money working for them. They want, you know, they want their money to go make money. They they want to grow their their money. Um, They don't want to give me money. It's not about me. And when I when I was able to really shift and think, okay, how can I how can I just really learn what other people need and then help them to do that? that's when things um, really shifted and then it became really easy to raise money for the right deals. And I look for deals that match people more than I look for people to match deals. That makes sense. Interesting. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So, um, you know, and there are some patterns, right? So not, not that I'm looking like, okay, I'm going to look for this particular deal for Noel, like, but the, There'll, there'll be a, a pattern of things that our investors will like, right? Uh, and they they want um, just different types of returns or tax benefits or or they or they want a diversification. And so we look for things that will match that. Well, that's really fascinating and nice that you take that into consideration um, because I think it's important to you know, keep in mind, these are not necessarily short-term commitments, right? So if someone gets into something that isn't a great fit for them uh, or vice versa, then it's it's not something that you're just easily tie out of uh, quickly. So I think that's a, that's a really wise lesson uh, for newer investors to keep in mind that raising capital is great and something that you need to do if you want to be syndicating, um, but just taking every dollar from anyone may not be the best choice for you long-term throughout the, the lifespan or the, the holding period of the investment. Yeah. If somebody want, you know, they want something quickly or they're going to, they want to put their money, but they're going to need it back. Uh, you know, just, these things are not, they're relatively illiquid, right? You can't, it's not easy to get your money back out and you have to see the investment through. And if it's going to be three years, five years, um, that's how long you, you need it. So I, it's, it's definitely a benefit. Like you want it to be mutual beneficial for both parties. So I do appreciate that. And like that, I mean, syndicating is not something that I know particularly a lot about. I think the idea of fundraising can be a little scary, at least for me personally. I don't know if you, it seems like yeah. you have thrived off of that because you know, you love the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> really scary. It's terrifying. Like, it was so oh my scary. gosh, you want to give me how much money? You know, like when you get that first check, I'm sure it was like, okay, I I have to make sure that I'm going to work hard for this person to make sure they get what they need. So as you're evaluating the deal and like making sure to your point, it's beneficial on both ends. Like, yeah, that just personally um, seems like a big mental hurdle to overcome for the first first time, for sure. I think the main thing to remember is that it's not again it's not about you as a syndicator it's it's your you're helping this person who i mean now the the banks are putting giving a little bit more interest but for a long time it's like okay there's somebody that's sitting there with money making 0.1 percent um and it's just sitting in the bank and it's not doing anything they're want or they don't want to have everything in the stock market or they just they want to have they want to be able to they have the tax benefits of the real estate. They want to be able to own. They want to be able to have their money working better for them. And so when you think about the fact that you're helping somebody grow their wealth, you're helping them to um, diversify, you're helping them to have these tax benefits, um, it, then it's not scary because you're you're not really thinking about oh gosh they're giving they've just wrote me a check for a hundred thousand dollars like they didn't write you a check for a hundred they wrote you know they've like invested in this property they, they they must know like and trust you enough to have you know entrusted that money to you um and you're gonna go off and bring it back to them with friends 
but you're doing them a service and helping them solve a problem. And it's win-win, right? But at least when I think about it in that way, it's not scary because then it's, I'm just trying to, to help. Yeah. No, you're so right. Thank you for that. For that reminder. It's a good reminder. You're helping someone else. And ultimately that's what we want to be doing. And I, I know that's what yeah. you want to be doing too, in terms of core foundational fundamentals. We can do it both in audiences um, and sharing that information as well as in the investor route and helping investors be able to make a better return um, than they can get at the bank or having their money just sit in a savings account, you know, thinking that that's, that's all you can do. <laughs> and there's not the just stock the stock market. market. There's plenty yeah. of other ways to invest. <laughs> You mentioned something about investing almost being like a, a service that you're providing to passive investors. And I'm curious with that, what does your typical communication or interaction with your passive investors look like? Yeah, it, it depends on the, um, the deal. So usually it's monthly and we'll just update, let them know what's going on. Um, I think when things are not as good, the communications would be more frequent, um, but generally once a month. And those are just updates about the property and general mm -hmm. market conditions, what you're seeing, what the plan yep. is. Okay. Exactly. I was gonna say not to cut us off, but I know we're getting close to time. So Patrick, Jeopardy round, get your one last final question in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, less of a question and more just a, a quick recap. I, I think that there are a few really important nuggets that Monique has called out here from many years of experience that a lot of new investors can really benefit from. Uh, the main one that I'm taking away is that you shouldn't be doing this alone and don't necessarily expect to be doing it alone. Like it takes a team, it is a team sport and the better, uh, quality of person or partner you can surround yourself with, the the easier the process will be um, and the more successful the process will likely be. Because if you're partnering with that higher quality experience or capacity, um, then you're likely to be able to overcome the challenges that each deal will inevitably throw at you. Um, and then the second thing is really be opportunistic about where you are and what the market is doing at any given time. Um, and don't necessarily feel the need to pigeonhole yourself into one specific asset class or type of property. Um, there are lots of deals out there to be done. Uh, and the more open-minded you are and the better quality people you're surrounding yourself with to do those deals, the better likelihood you will have of, of succeeding. So just wanna say thank you, Monique, for, for uh, sharing all of that with us because um, I think as, as a beginner commercial investor, like there are things that you have preconceived notions of. And uh, I think those two things are obviously very important um, and not necessarily intuitive for the newer investor. So um, thank you for, for calling those out based on, on what you've learned and, and how you found success. Thank you. And Monique, I know you have so much more to share and you also have multiple platforms that people can find you on. So can you share where people can find you to learn more about you and about real estate investing goddesses as well? Yeah, the best place is probably to go to my website, reigoddesses.com. There you can connect with our different social platforms um, and our the blog and the podcast and all the things. Perfect. We'll make sure to put those in the show notes as well. And seriously, cannot thank you enough, Monique. This has been really great. It's been so amazing talking with you and learning from you. Um, so thank you for joining us. And we hope everyone listening has gotten the same value that we have out of this. Thank you both. Thanks for tuning in to the Active Commercial Real Estate Investing Show brought to you by the One Only School of Commercial Real Estate Investing. Be sure to head over to our website at www.schoolofcrei.com for more free resources. While you're there, subscribe to our newsletter so you never miss a thing 